Um, so um, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for joining. I'm sorry about the, the glitch getting started, but you know, Zoom is only as good as, I guess we should pay the bill probably, uh, it would make sense. But um, we, if you don't know who Ellie Beer is, then you know, you're probably like not from this planet. Um, he's he's uh, perhaps one of the best known individuals in, I would say in the Jewish world, if not the world. And it's, it's not that often that we get to meet someone who single-handedly makes a tremendous impact and a difference in the world. In the world, I'm not talking about, you know, in one community, I'm saying in the world. And of course you'll read about and know about uh, United Atzal's fastest response time in the world. So you'll remember several months ago, Ellie was here for Shabbos and uh, you probably have seen a lot of Ellie in the news as of late. Uh, I could tell you that the last time that I saw Ellie, we had a real conversation was in Ben Gurion airport. I was heading home from home so I was leaving Israel, coming back to New Jersey, and Ellie started describing to me his travels that were coming up. So this is the beginning of February, and he says, well, let's see, I'm flying to LA, then I'm flying to India for a TED Talk, then I'm flying back to LA, and then I'm flying to Washington. It was something crazy like that, which made my head spin, just hearing what was going on. And then we saw briefly at, at APAC, and then of course, what happens is that um, we saw in the news that Ellie somehow ends up in Miami and he's not feeling well and he ends up in the hospital and of course at the height of the COVID crisis. And then so many people davening for your recovery and your well-being. And I have to say that I was brought to tears when I saw the footage, not only of you leaving the hospital, getting on the special plane, but the, the, the cavalry that was waiting for you in Israel when you returned was so heartwarming and that was a great news story because it was a story of strength but also a story of the community that you built that you had so because of the, all the, the thousands and thousands of people that you've helped over the years they just gave it right back to you and they dove in and we dove in for you and and they gave it so i want to thank you so much first of all i'm so glad to see you but i want to thank you for taking of your precious time to speak with us um and just to share maybe some of your experience so maybe you want to like walk us through or fly us through because you're always on a plane about what happened, what it was like being in the hospital, what you remember, what's like missing Pesach, all of those things and, 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 and bring us back to it. So uh, again, welcome Ellie. Thank you so much for joining us. So thank you so much for having me and I love your community. It's such a, such a great warmth to be by you and I was by you for Shabbos. So I hope very much, I hope that things will get back to normal very soon and you'll invite me again to, uh, to come to stay by you. Uh, in your in your neighbor in your community, so I as we you know we met in the airport and and I was planning my longest travel ever. I was going to five different countries, <clears throat> and in the countries I was going to different states and cities. Like in America, I was going to New York, uh, Washington D.C. of course, California, Miami, and then I was going to India, England, Qatar. I had a few other places I can't remember. Israel, of course. So all these places I was going to, everything seemed okay. You know, I was planning my trips, basically. I, I didn't want to go to China. China, everyone knew not to go to China. It was uh, obvious. And I went there only for Hatzalah reasons. I took my orange vest and I went to speak about the organization and raise money for the organization and saving lives. That was my motto. That's why I was going. So I was really shleich mitzvah. And my kids, my kids call me because I fly so much. I'm on the plane always, and I said this in Yeshua. My kids call me Avinu Shuba Shemaim. That's my <laughs> nickname, you know. So I'm always on the fly on the Shemaim. So um, when I got to England, actually, everyone was already talking about this. I was in London for a week, and after we saw each other in APAC, and uh, I was in England for a few days over the weekend. I was speaking there in a nice, beautiful shul in the in the Hampstead Southern Gardens. And uh, people were asking me about the corona that's going on in Israel and everything. And I was saying, like, Israel's under control. They shut down everything, and you have to have quarantine for two weeks. And from there, I went to Miami, and Miami looked fine, like 100% fine. And I celebrated There was 
beautiful. I was saying, I, I feel, I feel, uh, I feel. I'm, I'm losing your connection a little bit, Ellie. A little itchy here. Once I felt a little itchy in my mouth. Is this okay now? Uh, still a little bit in and out, sorry. Now? Now I see you, okay, now you're, you're moving, okay. I think. You're freezing. You must have the AC on high because you're freezing. Yes, we go back to Miami. That's what Sarah Klobinoff says. We go back to Miami, then we'll all warm up and unfreeze the uh, the screen. All right, so he's going to switch to his uh, his phone. Ah, technology. Gotta love technology. That's next. The uh, United Soul is going to fix Zoom. Um, I'm going to my phone. So sorry. Oh, wow, there's two of you. So let me unmute this one. Still frozen, still freezing on us. All right, I'm gonna go to another room. Mishana Baka, Mishana Mazel. Yeah, I'm gonna change to another room and I'll, I'll go to my porch. I'm so sorry. Please That's forgive fine. me. But don't ever change. <laughs> okay. I'm in Yerushalayim, so uh, you can see the view of Yerushalayim right in back of me. Oh, and, the, this and the, is sign, my... the sign from your neighbors across the street. I love that. Look, this is a view of your Shalim that I have. You're all welcome here. The lift uh, and uh, this is your Shalim. Beautiful. All right, so I'm back. I'm back here. Okay, sorry about uh, my problem I had, and I'll I'll switch I'll switch to the, to be like this, that everyone could see me better. Okay. All right, so go back to Miami. So I was in Miami for a few days and after Purim, Purim was great. And after Purim, I had a little itchy on my, on my throat and I right away realized something was wrong. So I went into an apartment. I, I, I isolated myself. I quarantined myself for three days. And after three days, I had a hard time breathing. So I went, ended up in, um, in Miami University, University of Miami in the hospital at three o'clock in the morning. The first thing they do is they check my, they did an x-ray on my, on my throat and they said, Ellie was sorry to let you know, but you have to go into, into a ICU. You're, you're, you're in a really bad situation. So that scared me very, very much. I was really, that, that moment, you know, I, I realized I have COVID-19. I didn't think I have COVID-19. I thought I was a strep throat or something. And then I was in the hospital for three days. They were trying to give me every medicine possible, um, you know, and it wasn't working. And then my breathing got worse and worse. And then they called me, they came over to me and they said, we have to induce you into coma. That moment when they said that, I said, is that necessary? Like I was like arguing with them and I, and I was trying to, they said, we have no choice. You're not breathing. Your, your breathing is terrible. Your oxygen level in your body is really low. And they decided to induce me to coma and intubate me. And, that, and, and that's when I decided to call my family. It was, it was Friday night in Israel. Uh, I, they didn't answer the phone, but I, I went through Hatzela, our command center. And I said, this is a, um, in very, very important. And I, and I knew I'm going to say goodbye because if it's COVID and they're intubating me, the chances, I saw the, I saw the statistics in, in uh, Italy and um, China, of course, and, and it was terrible. Uh, and I, uh, I, I went in and I said goodbye to my family. I said goodbye to my children. And then I sent a message to all the supporters of Atala. This was Friday afternoon in America. And Israel was already Shabbos, but 
I send us a message by WhatsApp to everyone I, you know, just to say, Davan for me, do chesed, and think about me, Eliezer Yehuda ben Chaya. But I also told people to make sure not to stop supporting United Hatzalah. It's not an organization that's luxury. It's actually life-saving every second. And I want to make sure that if, if God forbid something happens to me, and I was sure, I was almost sure that I'm never, I'm never, I'm never going to wake up again. And I want people to understand that this organization was my life mission for 32 years. And I don't want it to stop if something happens to me. And uh, two minutes later, the doctor is maybe, you know, the doctor realized I finished all my messages and everything. I shut my phone and he went straight in. And that was it. I was down for almost a month uh, in a coma. They were trying to fight for my life. And they couldn't figure out how to fix it. You know, they, they woke me up once after 18 days for a few hours. And the situation was even worse in the first place. And um, after, and they had to put me back the second time. And then when they put me back the second time, I was almost positive that was it. And I'm a young guy, I'm 46 years old, and I don't smoke. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't have any diseases or anything that I could relate to, to you know, why I got so sick. But I realized that if I have to be intubated the second time, the situation is so bad, they can't find a solution. And then I had no doubt that all the davening that people all around the world did, and your shul did, and the chesed people were doing, and tzedakah, and the, and the doctors who put a lot of effort to find new solutions, they came up with something, the combination of all that together, of stem cell research that they were doing on, on heart failure. And they decided for the first time to do it on a COVID patient. And uh, that moment was, uh, was incredible because uh, it changed my situation. And all of a sudden, the next day, I, they got me up. So again, you're an innovator. What? So again, for, uh, once again, you're an innovator. That uh, help, help with new uh, treatments and stuff. So. It's actually a treatment that they were doing in Israel for COVID patients. Uh, they were doing stem cells uh, treatment. But this was the first one, I think, in America. I'm almost sure it's the first one in America. For sure in Miami. Um, they were trying this out. And this is before they did the research. This is actually a compassion medicine that they gave. Me. So that's, that's, that's a, another miracle. Because if it was a, like a research, they were doing testing on it. So I could have had 50% placebo, you know. So this is something that I for sure got. And I know that it helped me. Wow. So I just have a couple of questions because this, and if you could talk about this. First of all, do you have any memory or of anything during that month that you were out? And what was it like when you were starting to pull out of it? And now, do you have any sort of, are there any effects from, from your ordeal? So things that no one talks about, I'll, I'll tell you some things that no one really talks about it. And I'm, I decided I'll be very open about it and talk about it because it's very, very important. I'm a strong guy physically and emotionally before this whole thing. I was very strong. I saw the worst things you could imagine. God forbid no one should ever see it. Bomb attacks and shootings and car accidents and thing, missile attacks on homes. I've been there. I treated people. I, I was involved with saving a lot of people over my lifetime. I'm a medic. So I went in very healthy and then I got sick, but I was healthy emotionally. When I woke up, all these bad, bad, bad memories for the month I was away at sleeping came up like real, like a reality. I went through so many bad dreams during that 30 days that were real, that were not regular dreams. They were reality for me. And it was like, you know, I could tell you I'm having a Zoom call with you and your community now. And tomorrow, and in an hour, someone will say, no, you were dreaming about it. I said, no, I wasn't dreaming. I was sitting, I had a Zoom call. And I'm so positive I'm having one now. That's how positive I was when I woke up and told people that I just, they asked me where I was and I thought I was in Europe because they had a huge um, flooding in Europe, really bad flooding. Um, uh, and uh, Alan, thank you for joining. I saw he's leaving. 
So and they had a very big flooding and I was intubating people and trying to save them. And so many people died in my hands. And I had children that we were trying to save and rescue from the floodings. That was one example, but many other terrible things that I was involved with. I saw some happy things, babies that I delivered. You know, a lot of things that happened that were not true, it never happened, but it felt like it happened. So when I woke up in the hospital, I was in a total shock, emotional shock. I, I don't know, not, I was very confused. It took me a very long time. And then after a while, because for part of the time I was tied, especially the day they woke me up, in the 18th day they woke me up, they kept my, they kept my hands tied because they still had pipes in my nose and stuff and they didn't want me to pull it out. So I remembered that and I had fears that I was kidnapped. So I actually was in the hospital in Miami, one of the best hospitals in America. And I am uh, calling my wife and I'm telling her, you have to call the FBI because they're murdering people in this place. I'm captured by them. And I'm giving her this whole Mishaga story and she's like smiling and laughing, not laughing, but smiling. And she says, Ellie, you're not, you know, you're not, you're in, you're in a hospital. I said, you don't believe me, right? I promise you it's true. I hear the screaming and yelling in the other rooms, what they're doing to people. They're going to come to me soon. And when they hear I'm Jewish, I'm going to be even more in trouble. Like, that's how I thought. I was like in crazy. <laughs> but it sounds funny now, but it wasn't funny when I was going through this. And that's when I realized it took me about two days or three days to get back to myself. But then I decided, first of all, I have to go through rehab. I couldn't, I couldn't get up. I couldn't walk. I lost 17 kilo, which is 35 pounds or so, 40 pounds of my weight. Most of it was muscles. So how do I, how do I run away? I wanted to run away because I thought they're going to kill me and I couldn't even run away. I, I didn't know how to rescue myself. I thought of offering one of the people their money, just get me out of here or something. That's how bad I thought the situation is. So after a few days, I, I started recovering. And then I found out then that I missed Pesach, which was devastating for me. So I went through all that trauma. And then I hear another trauma that I was there for over a month. And Pesach missed, missed Pesach passed. I woke up a day after Pesach. And I missed Pesach, and I was so devastated. So that, that was another one that I went through emotionally. But then I said, you know what? I must be positive because I have an opportunity. My, my chairman, uh, Mark Gerson, is an incredible human being, and he's a big, he, he knows everything about the Haggadah. And he, he's even writing, he's writing Haggadah, and he said, he calls me up and he says, Eli, why are you so depressed about Pesach? The Kohanim, when they missed Pesach, they couldn't come to Beis HaMikdash. They had another opportunity a month later, Pesach Sheni. Why don't you do Pesach Sheni? This week's Parsha. Right. Well, for us, not for you. Yeah, yeah, no, no, because I heard they gave a whole sermon. Someone gave a whole sermon about Pesach Sheni, and they were talking about my Pesach Sheni I did this week. So I heard about it in, in England, actually. So, um, so I actually decided, you know what? I'm going to get better. And I must be in Israel for Pesach Sheni, and I want to do a Pesach Sheni with my family. A real Pesach Sheni with the whole ceremony, Afikoma and negotiations, fighting with my kids, give it back, don't give it back, you know, the whole thing like you go through. And, uh, and finally, after um, uh, three or four days, the doctor says, I'm, I'm good. I, I'm out of COVID. I'm negative. They checked me four times. I'm good. I can't, I can't walk. I need to do rehab. But they said, if you want to leave to Israel, you can leave to Israel, but only you have to, you have to get there. You can't, you can't they, they were giving me conditions. I was in such bad condition. They said, you can't just fly to New York. And from New York, you have to fly direct. El Al didn't have any flights direct anymore. And I was, Hashem gave me another beautiful miracle. And I'm, it came from nowhere. Um, Dr. Miriam Adelson called my wife in Israel and she said, I want Ellie back in Israel. I see what he's going through. She was in contact with the hospital the whole time. She said, I want Ellie in Israel. And I'm going to send the plane to take him. So first we said no, because 
I felt awkward, very awkward, but she insisted and she said, you know, this will be our biggest pleasure if Ellie could go back and start this life-saving mission again in Israel. So I said, you know, the next day he said, okay, I can't, I can't take it here anymore. I heard the screaming from the other rooms. It was so hard for me. I was, I was in the hospital with so many people suffering. And I just said, I need to get out of there. And the only way to go, the only way to, I didn't have anywhere to go in Miami. The doctor said, I have to go to a rehab center. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to Israel. And I went to Israel. And when I got to Israel, it was the most wonderful thing I ever had. That was, that was something. I mean, I, obviously, the, the, the international coverage of your arrival and the way all the emergency vehicles were lined up in the airport in formation, it was really, it was really something. Um, how has the adjustment been? I mean, it's been some time now, but how's the adjustment since you've been home, sort of like gradually getting back to yourself? How's that been going? So um, getting back to Israel in a hard time. When I landed, the airport was shut down. The streets were empty. I saw Israel, you know, it looked like you were, you were landing in Yom Kippur. That's how bad it was. Um, so I really landed in the midst of everyone was in, everyone was in quarantine in Israel. The whole thing was shut down. And then all of a sudden I come and I'm like, I could walk around. They let me walk around. They, I got a permit. You, you had it already. You could do whatever you want. You know, you don't have to do quarantine. You don't have to. So I, I was on a wheelchair the first few days. And then I said, you know what? The hell with it. I'm not going to, I'm, I don't want a wheelchair. I don't want to get used to this. It's really nice because everyone has to do things for you. You know, you don't have to scratch your back. Someone scratches your back. Scratch your head, get your cup of water. You know, you don't have to do anything. But then I decided that I want to be walking within a week like a regular person. And I got someone to come to me every day for a couple of hours to help me rehab. I got rid of all these extra things that were helping, like the, you know, the wheelchair and everything else. And then I said, it's all in the head, you know, I have to really fight it and, and make my muscles stronger. It was very hard. I couldn't sleep. It was very hard for me to sleep. And uh, within, uh, within a week, I was walking about a, a kilometer, which is, uh, how much is a kilometer? Like a half a mile about? Yeah, and. Long. And it was incredible. It was an amazing feeling. And then I said, I want to eventually, I was staying in Tel Aviv because a good friend of mine um, said, stay in my apartment. Uh, and uh, it's right across the beach. You have a nice view of the beach and it's really comfortable. And I live, I live in Yushalayim on the fourth floor with no elevator. So it's great to live with a great view, but no elevator. And I couldn't get up four flights. It was impossible. So, so I decided to stay in Tel Aviv for a month. And then a month, I mean, just right, just, uh, just last Friday, this last Friday, I, we moved back to Yerushalayim and, uh, it was a great feeling. And I, Sunday I came back to the Atella headquarters and it was incredible, incredible to be there. So many volunteers and, and employees were there waiting. And I, we had like a little gathering and I, on the roof because, uh, um, we don't want to do it inside. And I spoke about, you know, Emuna about miracles and about coming back to save more lives. I said, we have a big mission in front of us. We treat almost 2,000 people every day in Atzala. We can't stop it even for one second. And I was very proud of them that what they did while I was sick, they did incredible work in terms of Atzala. They went ahead and they started a whole humanitarian effort. And I mentioned to them the story that changed my whole perspective about my health. I was so depressed the first few days. And Eli Pollack, who's the executive director in Israel, he says to me, you should just know, Eli, you have so much more to live for. Stop with this thing. Put everything aside. Don't think about the trauma you went through. Just think about what we have to do. I said, give me a story that could help me elevate my, my spirit. So he says to me that Erev Pesach, five minutes before Pesach, a woman called Hatzalah. Our number in Israel is 1221. So people, thousands of people were calling for help, elderly people, Holocaust survivors who had no way of getting food or anything else. They needed help for even, they had one lady, she didn't have electricity, no electricity, no 
no electrician was coming because they weren't working. They didn't want to go. So Atzala volunteers went to their house and they fixed the electricity for it. That was, that's, that's what we were doing besides the regular emergencies, life-saving emergencies. So the woman says, she's 90 years old, and she says, I live in Batyam and I don't have candles for Pesach. I want to light candles. And I need candles. Could someone bring me candles to my house? And it's five minutes before candle lighting, you know, like, and, uh, and they send out the message to the closest volunteers. And Eli Pollack says to me, a volunteer by the name of Ibrahim. Ibrahim is Muslim. He picked up that call. He, he, he jumped on an ambicycle. If you know what these ambicycles, I, I drove one into your school, if you remember. And that ambicycle, he drove to the Makolet in, in Jaffa, which is right next to Batyam. He, he picked up a box of candles. And then he saw a, a beautiful bouquet of flowers there. And he bought that too. And he bought it from his own money. And he drove to this woman in Batyam. He went up three flights up, knocked on the door. And she opened the door and she sees this volunteer with this orange vest. And the big smile, he's tall. He's, uh, he's a very dark, an Arab guy. She knew right away he's an Arab. You could see immediately, you know, in Israel, you right away realize who's, and she sees him with the Hatzala vest and she started crying and she gave him such a hug. He gave her the flowers and the candles and he gave her a hug. He was, of course, with a mask and a, and a you know, protection gear. But she said to him that he saved her holiday because she always lights candles. And then he saw she had a number on her hand. And she was a Holocaust survivor. And he knows what a Holocaust survivor is because he's an Atzala. He treats a lot of Holocaust survivors. But to do such a simple thing, to give a lady like that, he didn't save her life. He, may, he didn't give her a resuscitation. He didn't shock her with the defibrillator. He just gave her candles and flowers. And he said to her, Chag Sameach. And this woman said to him, you saved my life because I couldn't have gone into Pesach without my lighting candles. And... He left, and I said to Eli Polak, I want to speak to this Ibrahim. So Eli Polak put him on the phone, and I was crying when I heard the story from Ibrahim. He's such a sweet guy. He has a very heavy Arab accent. So he says to me, Eli, you should just know I joined that cellar because I was driving a truck. I was a truck driver. And next to Ramle, next to the airport, actually, he, he crashed. The truck turned over, and he was in a serious car accident, a truck accident. And he was in a critical condition. And the ones who saved him were at volunteers from that area. And he said, I decided then, when I woke up, a year later, he recovered. It took him a year, the whole rehab, and he was in the hospital for a long time. He said he's going to join Atzala. And today he's a volunteer of United Atzala. And he, when he did that mitzvah, he said, when I did that mitzvah, I decided for the rest of my life, I'll be volunteering for this organization. That's incredible. First of all, my, my allergies are really acting up now, so forgive me. But um, the, it's not um, your allergies. It's not your yeah. allergies. You're crying because <laughs> I was crying when I heard it. That's unbelievable. So I mean, if if I didn't think you were so incredible until now, now it's you know just puts you over the top. I I know you have to run to Tel Aviv, right? How much more time do you have? Like uh, five minutes. Um. So I I I have a question. We have we still we have a number of families in our community and in our extended community who are going through. Uh, really big challenges, health crises, and some are, are long-term challenges. Could you please give some, some chizuk, some advice, some courage to these families uh, of what they're going through, you know, maybe f drawing from your own experience, what, what would you say to them? Because, you know, we daven for them daily, but I, I think a word from you would be such, such chizuk for them, so please. So first of all, I want to say something. I was in the hospital in a really bad condition, a critical condition. <clears throat> the doctors almost gave up, really. I'm telling you that 30 days in, a, in intubation and they saw my situation and they didn't have anything to, to do anymore. And the doctor, after I woke up, one of the doctors came over to me and he says to me, you should just know, I'm not Jewish, I'm not a believer in God, but I know now that there is a God because the way people cared about you and prayed for you and so much energy of prayers came to your room. There was no other reason that you were survived if not for that. So I'm saying to all the people who are suffering and think there is no end to this, and they think that this is gonna, you know, the situation will be worse and God forbid even, you know, end in a terrible tragedy. 
you should just know that prayers are so powerful. The energy from praying from a, from praying to Hashem, but the, also the energy of doing that prayer towards and thinking of the person you're praying for, davening for, is so powerful. Don't give up. Because giving up is the worst thing you could do. You have to be very, very positive to re- accept all these prayers. You know, when someone says, no, it's not going to help, you know, don't pray, don't pray. No, it is going to help. It is going to help. And you're going to see miracles. I'm a miracle. I'm not, I'm not a mystical guy. I'm a regular practical person. But I know that I was saved because of miracles of chesed and davening and tzedakah. So these three things are what's going to save your relatives and your family and your friends because the medicine is not there yet. No one has one medicine that's going to help. It's not like, you know, some diseases, you, oh, you put that medicine and everything is magic. There is no magic for, for COVID. The COVID attacks so badly the lungs and other parts of the body. So please continue praying and don't give up because giving up, and it actually stops the, the, the energy of prayers. And you need Ishtadlus, of course. So I'm telling you, Bezrat Hashem, all of your members are going to come back to Shul, Bezrat Hashem, and all their families are going to be well. And it's going to be a, just a hard adjustment just to come back and, and do reha- you know, rehab and everything else. But very soon, they're all going to be back to normal, Bezrat Hashem. And that's something that applies not only to, to COVID challenges, we have people facing other challenges as well, but I think uh, obviously we, we rely heavily on modern medicine, but I think the, the spiritual medicine is where we can all, we can all contribute. And um, you know what, Ellie, I can't wait, first of all, to, to see you in person back in Israel when we're able to go back to Israel. And I can't wait to host you back here and, and uh, just to continue to inspire us. So I, I wanna thank you so much for your time I want to thank you for thank what you. you bring to the world. And I want to thank Miriam for, for arranging this. And uh, I treasure our yeah. friendship. And, and I have to thank Jason Katz because he persisted for two years to say, can, you, can, can Ellie come, can Ellie come, can Ellie come? And I said, yeah, finally. And, and by the way, am I, am I so happy that I said yes? Because you know, you're not just another uh, nudnik, but really somebody, like I said in the beginning, that, that change, changes the world on a regular, regular basis. May Hashem bless you and your family with help. Rabbi, yeah, I want to, I want to, first of all, thank you for the brachas. I, it means so much for me. I love you so much. You are such a humble, you know, community leader and rabbi. Everyone loves you. And when I was in shul, I realized that how much people love you and, and listen to you. So first of all, thank you for inviting me for this Zoom call also again and having me the first time. And Jason, I love Jason. We still, I spoke to him just a few days ago. He's a gem and he was the one who didn't give up. And, uh, and, and Miriam Tenenbaum, who's here, this uh, incredible lady who's here, she's, she's going to help Bezrat Hashem bring me again to your shul. She represents United Asela in, uh, in New Jersey. And uh, last thing I want to say to you, if you could say that story with Ibrahim, this Shabbos, um, it will mean a lot to me because the Kiddush Hashem out of this. I wish I could bring Ibrahim over America, but I made a short video actually with Ibrahim, I met him afterwards in Tel Aviv when I came back and I wanted to see him. He's just a simple guy. He's a truck driver, that's what he does, but he saves lives. And he's, he's Muslim, but he helped a Holocaust survivor, a lady who that woman, she's 90 years old, and I know when my mother is, nine, my mother is 91, if she doesn't get what she needs, it, it could draw, you know, you, you, in that age, you can't say, okay, I'm gonna miss lighting candles. Lighting candles is so important for her. And he went ahead and he fulfilled her wish. In the worst time, no one was going out of their home, Arab Pesach. Arab Pesach, they had a lockdown in Israel. And he went and he did that mitzvah. It's a Kiddush Hashem that people should know about. We have 6,000 volunteers all over Israel. And 500 of them are Arabs. And that's a beautiful Kiddush Hashem. And as a Jew, I'm very proud of this thing. So I want people to know about this. And also our website, if we could, uh, Miriam, Maybe she could say the website or I could say it. Yeah, It'd and I will share that. Great if people know. Um, and and, and this, is not um, about, this is not about an ask. This is just about uh, really no, no, no. what you do. I just want to and, ask because people always ask me, what's our website? It's, it's israelrescue.org. Very simple, israelrescue.org. I always say it because people afterwards say, you know what? I want to learn more about the organization of support. And they can't find the website. So thank you so much for having me. 
And you should just, again, be gesund and nachas. And thank you, because you know what? I have to prepare a sermon for the first time in three months, but now you just gave it to me. So uh, really, uh, another, another gift you're giving to the world. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you everybody for joining. Again, this is being recorded. We're gonna send it out to the broader public. And uh, again, just keep, keep on the path to full, full recovery and doing the incredible things that you're doing for, for the world. So uh, thank you so much and, and uh, safe travels to Tel Aviv and Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.